For the first time in human history, more people live in cities than not. The current system is unsustainable. As our cities continue to grow, we need to take new approaches to how we design them and how we live in them. The current regional growth model processes inputs, such as fossil fuels, food, and people, to produce synergies of activity, culture, and economic development. But this model also generates outputs, like greenhouse gases, waste, and inequity. This current linear metabolism consumes and pollutes, but we can start doing something to change that right now. To build more efficient cities, we must eliminate these externalities while simultaneously repairing past errors. We must think beyond sustainability and resiliency and develop a net positive city, a city that regenerates itself. Regenerative cities apply outputs from one system as inputs of another. Renewable energy, water conservation, and local food production influence the design of the built environment, including infrastructure, transportation, and land use. These improved regenerative efficiencies in turn mend our urban ecology. As we endeavor to create cities that are responsible to future generations, we must learn to heal as we grow in a manner that makes cities more equitable, just, and livable. Not for a few, but for everyone. It is in this spirit that SOM hopes to define a new ethos in human habitation. We call this initiative Region Cities. Region stands for regenerative, a method of urban development that seeks to build a restorative relationship with nature and create inclusive well-being, health, and happiness for everyone now and into the future. So how do we transform our current weaknesses into a net positive city? In this video series, we'll learn from uncommon collaborators and explore contemporary innovations that illustrate the components of a regenerative city. There are 10 principles that drive SOM's city design practice. They form the foundation of our region cities equation. Uniting each of these principles strengthens our goal of creating a diverse and responsive civic framework that produces more than it consumes. This is our ethos. This is region cities. Cities are attracting more residents, business, and investment than ever before. And at the same time, the people who paid their dues in cities during their long decline, people of color, low-income people, aren't reaping the benefits of this renewed investment. Despite entrepreneurship being on the front cover of every magazine and on TV, entrepreneurship as an activity has been on decline in the U.S. since really the early 1980s. And so we're looking for levers that we can use to increase uh, that work. One of those is the development and uh, fortification of entrepreneurial ecosystems, the systems that support entrepreneurs in communities. It shouldn't matter where you're from or who you are, what your background is, that you should have access to the opportunity to become an entrepreneur and to really forge and build the life that you want. Cities are economic engines that drive innovation and productivity. When more people come into closer contact with one another, it produces more sustainable living patterns. It also encourages social interaction and facilitates the public dialogue that creates a more inclusive culture. Equity is one of the biggest issues I think our cities are facing. The more we can make a neighborhood or a city look like nature, if we think about it, nature is successful because of its diversity and resilience. We know that if more people of color and marginalized groups own businesses and operate businesses, they tend to hire people from also marginalized backgrounds. So we see entrepreneurship as not only a way to empower individuals, but also as a way to create jobs for some of the most disenfranchised people. We could start thinking in these new kind of ways of how cultures live together so we can unwind the problems that they were put around intentionally. As we work with a community or a project, we try to take a deep dive, a deep analysis of the ecosystem of a place. And by ecosystem, I mean all the human factors as well as the environment. What are the barriers that are keeping certain audiences from accessing entrepreneurship. If minorities started businesses at the same rate as their white counterparts in the United States, we would instantly add uh, a million new companies and 10 million new jobs. Uh, if women started businesses at the same rate of men, we'd instantly add a million new jobs. So there's an economic opportunity for us to do more to open up opportunities for women and minorities. 
people in rural communities and immigrants, other folks who's facing these systematic barriers to entrepreneurship. It is not just good for those entrepreneurs, but it is good for our economy and for our country and for the globe. A country, a city, our communities do better when equity is at the center of an economic growth model. Otherwise, you know, if people are not making enough money to support themselves or their families, this means that we need increased level of services. This means that people aren't able to buy goods and the economy is not as strong as it could be. So having a new growth model that centers equity actually is better for the bottom line. An ecosystem that supports entrepreneurs is a natural living system, but we've spent way too long looking at just one component of a city. So we say, we're gonna solve poverty, so we're just gonna look at jobs. We're gonna solve entrepreneurship, so we're just gonna look at how do we get more angel investors. But the reality is it's a complex system where everything from transportation to housing to electricity to education, it's all related. And if you can connect that together in the right way and create a culture that says you can create here, uh, you're gonna unlock more entrepreneurs. With our developments, the more we can increase connectivity and diversity and have it look a lot more like nature, the more likely that neighborhood, that city, that region will be resilient, will be successful, will be on a positive track financially. I can see that already. That's easier said than done. The dynamism of our communities facilitates the upward mobility necessary to define a new economic model. As human-built systems, cities are shaped by the political process. Leveraging a community's dormant potentials empowers grassroots decision-making that can catalyze a virtuous cycle of job creation and equitable economic development. We need to create a model that is integrated. You cannot just look at transportation. You cannot only look at creativity. You have to look at energy and water. What makes the social justice of our community? And then you need to produce a system that facilitates that balance. You can create an urban garden, but who's gonna maintain it? We're intending to make this a, what we call a regenerative alley, but we are in fact in a food desert. So the idea is to develop plans and programs that uh, not just maintain the status quo, but are able to regenerate themselves. Preserving agricultural lands and retrofitting cities for urban farming protects the integrity of our cities and builds resilience in the local food chain. It also contributes to alleviating poverty and reducing food insecurity. We've done an amazing thing in the last 30 years to make food cheaper and to make food more efficient and more available. In the meantime, we forgot about the local. What can be produced very close to the consumer? How could that increase nutrition? The distance between when a plant is harvested and it gets in someone's mouth, the less nutrition it has. So if we can do harvest and put in someone's mouth in 30 minutes, then you're gonna get the maximum amount of nutrition. We have this, um, this pyramid of death here. You know, you got the fast foods, the liquor store, that's the grocery store, and the dialysis center right across the street. It's not about food with me. It's about people, period. The idea of scalability, to scale something up or to scale something down, whether it's in your backyard or scale it up to commercial size, has been our theme. So whether it's hydroponics that are small, hydroponics that can be large-scale commercial, all of that plays out. Now you can drive it into a formula. Well, how many acres would it need? Would you need to create that many calories? How much would you have to do to make it, and not full replacement, but maybe 20% of the diet of a regional area that's got need? And suddenly you can, it's not hard to figure out, well, what, what, what do you want to accomplish here? One amazing thing is when you talk about technology, there's usually a small group of people that benefit from it, but this is food. It's everyone that's an eater every day. So making that more available for the next generation of farmers to play with, they'll start as hackers, makers, students, scientists, teachers, learning these tools, just like I can remember the first computer lab uh, in my school. It's about creating empowered people on tools that they understand. And then secondly, 
maybe it's most important to create good jobs. You know, when we're working in the farm, it's this different environment. It's a different climate that we're in. It's really serene and beautiful. When you're around plants, when you are in nature, a different part of your brain is working. Whatever we do, it has to be a model where the community is not only a cheerleader, but the community actually participates. We're here in South Central Los Angeles at my Parkway Garden, which is, I call, my Eden on the street. It's real simple, beauty in, beauty out. These communities, as you see, are not built for beauty. You know, they're not built for people. They're built for cars. They're built for commerce. This is built for people. It's not just food. <laughs> you know, it's um, freedom. Gardening can feed a family. Farming can feed a city. This will take a substantial knowledge and investment. With the diverse spectrum of urban agricultural strategies, a regenerative city can grow food, public health, and prosperity for all. When you walk down the street and it feels really great, you know that that's a really great street. And maybe as a designer, you might be able to point out some of those things. When you walk down another street and you know it feels not that great. When you're talking about good design, you're talking about the person that you're designing it for, whether you're designing sunglasses, a house, or a city. Fundamentally, we want to create vibrant, engaging communities where everybody can live a high quality of life, where they have access to the resources they need to be healthy, where they have access and opportunities to interact with their neighbors, and where the built environment supports healthy behaviors and the way people move through their lives on a day-to-day -day basis. When I think about complete streets, when I think about a 21st century street, I don't think every mode has to win on every street, but I do think that what we are talking about is how the street functions and who the street serves. And it should absolutely be based on safety first and foremost, prioritizing and protecting the most vulnerable users of the street, and that's people biking and walking, and that it doesn't assume as its default that we're trying to move as many people as quickly as possible. Instead, it strives towards other metrics. Realigning the mobility hierarchy of cities from the automobile back to the pedestrian provides an opportunity to rethink public rights of way and see them as the city's most important open spaces, as places for expanding their ecological, economic, and social functionality and enhancing the sense of place. Walkability is in high demand, and yet most of the U.S. is not walkable. Only 30% of cities with a population of over 200,000 people would be considered walkable. If you actually provide the infrastructure and amenities to bike safely, people definitely take advantage of it. What we found when we looked at the crashes that were happening in Los Angeles, and every year there's between 240 and 260 people who die on our streets, half of those are people biking and walking, even though they represent a really small portion of the overall crashes. When the crashes happen, they're more likely to result in severe or fatal outcomes. It quickly became obvious that there were really strong patterns in parts of the city that suffer other negative public health outcomes, like high incidences of childhood asthma and diabetes, and they also are places that have high concentration of immigrants, high concentration of people living below the poverty line, and high concentrations of people who are dependent on transit as a lifeline service. If you're trying to actually increase the health of the community, let's look at the built environment, figure out what's missing from that regard. We want to look at health outcomes, so mostly non-communicable diseases like chronic diseases, diabetes, heart disease, obesity, as well as the actual health care costs. Most people only drive in this department. Some of them take transit, very few bike and walk. 
So they're always gonna design from a driver's perspective. That's understandable. Engineers, so highly skilled, went to school because they're problem solvers. So if you can figure out a way to change the problem that they're solving and get them to have some empathy for all the users they're designing for, then it can be very powerful. The data that we're collecting is known to actually impact the outcome we're trying to influence. And that data we know is about things that are manipulatable. You can actually change whether there's a tree, you can change the land use structure, you can change the width of the roads. If you want to build something that lasts, people have to love it. And for people to love it, it has to be beautiful. So we cannot take a utilitarian approach or a hands-off approach to the design and beauty of the public realm. The built environment influences how we move around, work, and engage with our communities. Designing public and private spaces to encourage more active lifestyles improves physical and mental health, increases economic activity, and expands access to everything a city has to offer.